Today we're going to talk about one of the most controversial topics in the church. Unnecessarily controversial, but controversial nonetheless, and it is worship. I once heard a congregant speak to the worship leader following a church gathering, and he said, I gotta tell you, I didn't like that worship set. And the worship leader had an amazing yet very unpastoral response. He said, oh, well, I'm so sorry to hear that, but it's actually good news. And the guy who had said it in the first place was a little bit confusing. He goes, it's good news because we weren't worshiping you. My friends, our title today is that it's not about you. I used to serve in a tech capacity at a church and on Sunday mornings I would help with the sound sometimes and there would always be some people that had some strong feelings about whether or not the worship should be louder or quieter and well I'll be completely honest most of the people who expressed their concern thought it should be much quieter. There was one individual in particular who would turn around to me while I'm in the sound booth every Sunday morning and he would motion at his ear and you know say to me it's too loud and so I would do something this is confession time I would do something every week and I called it the phantom fix I wouldn't actually touch the board but I would pretend to touch the board and then I give him a thumbs up and he'd give me the thumbs back up right back even though it sounded exactly the same it's not about you I'm thankful, church, that that is not one of the struggles that we have here at Cornerstone Community Church. In fact, many people would say that as it comes to worship, it's one of our strong suits. I mean, we're in the middle of this process that's called Regenerate, evaluating how we're doing with the mission that God has given us to reach our community and beyond with the hope and saving message of Jesus. And one of the things that has been communicated over and over again from the very beginning is that one of our greatest areas of strength is God-exalting worship. And even though what it looks like today looks a lot different than it did pre-pandemic, it's still an area that I think that we are blessed and gifted in. I mean, we've got incredible worship leaders, we've got incredible musicians, we've got people who serve with excellent technical skills and capacity in sound and video and editing, and I thank God for them. And there are actually many other churches that use our worship content in their gatherings, and we're very happy to share that with anyone who asks. We love to equip and encourage the local church. But let's take a moment today and really talk about this idea of what is worship. Because if you've been with us for a while, you probably have a good idea. But let's keep it straight. For those of you who are watching for the first time, for those who are not church people, when we say worship or worship team or worship song, there are these images that really come from a place of not understanding and confusion. I mean, if that's you, you might think of rituals or, you know, like uh, these ancient bowing down to statues or secret societies. I was working at a church that celebrated its 100th anniversary in the community, and that's really something to celebrate. <sighs> Pardon me. But we had an article in the local newspaper to talk about the 100th anniversary of our church. Well, the author of the article was not a church-going individual, and I think the pastor had mentioned something about a worship service, and he simply assumed that that meant all of the following, these rituals, and in fact, one of the words he used to describe the worship experience was chanting. And we looked at that and we said, where does this come from? Well, that's certainly not something that's included in our gatherings. And so let's take a moment and give you the main point today. Let's define what worship is. Well, the main point is that worship is not about you. It's about God. Worship is not about your personal preferences or your desires. It is about exalting God. Worship is giving attention to and ascribing worth to God. Worship is the odd response to the saving acts of God that in the praiseworthy character of God. And when we understand who our Father God is and what He has done for us, 
worship is also a priority. The Word of God, Jesus tells us to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole mind, your whole strength, and your whole soul. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And this is the first command of Jesus. And so if you've ever asked the question, if you've ever asked the question, what am I here for? What are we here for? What, what is the purpose? Well, it's to love God. It's to worship him, to bring him glory, and to minister to him. And this is a theme that runs throughout the entirety of Scripture. We can take a look at the Old Testament and the ancient priests. Their primary role, we see in the book of Ezekiel, their primary function is to come near to God and to minister to him. And that primary function was true in the Old Testament, and it's true in the New Testament and today as well. In fact, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, the New Testament calls you a minister, a part of a royal universal priesthood, whether you have been ordained by a religious organization or not. And your job is to fulfill that primary function of loving and ministering to God. In fact, we can go all the way to the end of the book. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 to 10 tells us that every tongue, every nation, every tribe will stand shoulder to shoulder, bowing down before and worshiping God. Regardless of how you feel about it, you have been made to worship God. Well, maybe you'd say to me, I don't feel comfortable with that idea. You say, I'm a pretty reserved person and so... I'll just be silent on this issue and practice all of the other disciplines. Well, I kind of get it, but the truth is that we all worship. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, you worship. The question is, who and what do you worship? A little bit more than 10 years ago, I went to a Montreal Canadiens game at the Bell Centre in Montreal, live. And don't worry, I have since repented for that, by the way, <laughs> because who can cheer for the Montreal Canadiens? Only those who have made terrible life decisions. And I stick to that. That, my friends, is true. However, I was there at the game and I could not help but think the entire time how this was a worship experience. You see, there were people gathered together with one another to express their admiration, their thankfulness, their awe to those individuals that made up their team, their tribe, their, their following, their clan. And so the slightest victory, I mean, a body check, recovering the puck, shooting at the net, scoring a goal resulted in this monumental expression of praise, of worship, even to the point where between periods during the uh, <coughs> during the break the intermission if there was a replay of something that had happened during the previous period there would be just as much excitement and expression of joy and admiration for what had happened during the game my friends whatever your feelings are on this issue the reality is that we all worship the question is who and what do we worship so why is worship a spiritual discipline? Well, it's a discipline because we are constantly facing the temptation to worship things other than God, who alone is worthy of our worship. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't enjoy or appreciate things in life like hockey games, unless it's the Montreal Canadiens, but we should always be reminded that only God and God alone is worthy of our worship. Don't miss the significance of the third temptation of Jesus in the wilderness by the enemy. You see, soon after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, he sent by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy and begin his ministry. And the enemy is standing there and he says that you see everything before you and it will all be yours. I will give it to you in exchange for what? An act of of worship. And on the surface, it seems pretty harmless. Because isn't that what Jesus is here for? To rule and to reign over everything in the kingdom? Well, yes. But what we really need to come to understand is that this is far more nefarious because the enemy is trying to get Jesus to shortcut past his mission and skip the cross. 
And so Jesus responds and he says, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You are free to enjoy life, to love and to laugh and to be happy. And those things are good and they are godly. But never forget that our best selves without Jesus are doomed. We are not saved by our bank account or our titles or the letters behind our name. We are saved by Jesus and Jesus alone. Worship is a spiritual discipline because it doesn't depend on feelings. There's a story in the book of Acts chapter 16 about two men named Paul and Silas. And they've had an encounter with Jesus and they're just absolutely on fire for him. And they're walking around and they're sharing the good news of Jesus with everyone around them. Around them, In Acts chapter 16, verse 16, it tells us that they are on their way to daily prayer. That every day they're going to this prayer meeting. They're going to church. And as they're going to church, there is a woman, actually a slave, who is possessed by a spirit. It is allowing her to tell the future. She was a fortune teller. And this slave who's owned by her masters is actually producing a lot of income for those masters. And she's following Paul and Silas and she's speaking out loud about them and over them and <clears throat> declaring who they are. And it's creating a lot of confusion for the people around them. And so out of frustration, Paul turns around and casts the spirit out of her. She is healed. I mean, this is a good thing, right? But her masters don't think that it's good. Because they come to understand and realize that without that spirit inside of her, it's going to impact their bank accounts. And so even though they didn't have any issues with Paul and Silas earlier, when it begins to impact their income potential, they begin to call out to the crowd and say, hey, these men are different than us. They're Jews. They teach things that are different than our culture and our customs. They do not belong here. And the crowd turns on Paul and Silas. And they strip them naked. And they begin to beat them with their hands and with sticks. They throw them in prison and put their feet in stocks. And my friends, that is what I call a bad day. I mean, can you imagine Silas turning to Paul and saying, See, I told you I really didn't want to go to church today. I mean, how many of us would be in a bad mood after that? For most of us, all that it takes to be in a bad mood is some rough weather and some heavy traffic. Or maybe you see a news headline on your social media feed that really just rubs you the wrong way. These guys, they're, they're living it up for Jesus. They're going to a prayer meeting and they get assaulted and imprisoned for it. Some of us, if we're in Paul and Silas's shoes, we might say, hey, you know what? We're out. I'm done. Because God, if you were real, if you were really real, God, and, and like I thought we were tight, I thought we were besties and that you had my back and that you said you would never abandon me. Clearly, that's not true. For some of us, this experience would cause us to walk away from our faith altogether. And I'm so thankful that Paul and Silas understood that just because you are suffering does not mean God has abandoned you. That they understood what we can understand today. That suffering is not something that we get to skip. That's, that suffering, but we don't have a figurehead off in the sky who doesn't understand or doesn't care. But we have a loving Heavenly Father who has sent His Son to suffer for us. And so when we suffer, that God joins in that suffering with us and knows and cares about what we go through. And so Paul and Silas, in their suffering, they're having a bad day. Let's be honest, all right? There's not much that they can control about this situation, but they can choose their response. And they choose to respond with praise. And I thank God that they did that. Acts chapter 16, verse 25 says, About midnight, Paul and Silas, as they are imprisoned, were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners we're listening to them. You know, Paul and Silas probably didn't feel like worshiping, but worship is a discipline because it doesn't depend on your feelings. Now, this is an assumption, but I think that Paul and Silas probably weren't asking each other whether or not they felt up for singing some spiritual songs and hymns. You know what? 
just not really in the mood right now. I'm not feeling the best. Well, no, that's not what's happening. That's not what's happening. There are two times in your life when you should worship. When you feel like it and when you don't. And the result is in this situation that the ground shakes, the chains come off and they are set free. Not only that, but the guard gives his life to Jesus and goes home and his entire household says yes to Jesus and is saved. I mean, come on somebody. What is the purpose of any spiritual discipline? It is to position us to experience the transformation that God wants us to experience. And so on your worst day, in your worst moment, in your worst feeling, discipline yourself to choose worship. A number of years ago, I was a youth pastor and we planned this trip. We're on our way on this road trip around Lake Erie and we're so excited about it. The first night we're going to stop at this amazing church in Windsor and they're doing a church plant. We're going to help them with that. The second day we're going to Cedar Point, you know, the, the, the big, uh, amusement park in Sandusky, Ohio. And the third day, we're going to finish our trip. We're going to have church and communion together on the beach of Lake Erie on the American side as we make our way home. And this is absolutely going to be amazing. The second morning, we're in Ohio on our way to the park and somebody cuts us off on the freeway. And I have to hit the brakes pretty hard, but we were safe. And so I was able to slow down, but from that moment forward, things just felt a little bit different. You know, the, the brakes started to feel a little bit spongy, and the closer and closer that we got to the park, the, the more warning signs and lights ended up coming up on the dashboard. Well, we were able to make it to the parking lot of the park, and I said, you know what, guys, you go in, <clears throat> and I'm going to deal with the car. I'm going to find somebody to look at the car, because something just feels a little bit off. <clears throat> so at 4 o'clock. I show up at the front desk at Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio, and say, I need a cab. And they say, oh, sir, that's not going to happen. So why not? They say, cabs won't pick you up here. So why not? They say, well, because you have to drive through the admissions gate to get here. And there have been too many people who have stiffed their cab drivers for that admission. And so uh, they, they simply will not come here any longer. And I said, well, that's a real problem because here's the scenario. And so um, when's the next shuttle? And they said, well, sir, we have shuttles, but uh, they're not running anymore. They're done for the day. And I said, well, that's a serious problem. How, how about this? What if there is a staff member who's finishing their shift and I could, I could pay them to drive me to the shop on their way home? Oh, sir, we just had shift change. You're going to have to wait several hours for that to work. I said, okay, well, what, a, what about an officer? Can a police officer bring me the rest of the way, uh, you know, to the shop? And they said, sir, it's so busy today. No officer is going to be able to do that. I said, fine. How long does it take me to walk to the shop? And they said, you can't do that. Why can't I do that? Well, because there's the bridge in between here and there, and you are not legally allowed to walk over the bridge. It's like walking on the freeway. I said, I said let me get this straight. I can't get a cab. I can't get a shuttle. I can't get a ride from an employee and I can't get a ride from an officer, and I can't walk, but if I walk, I'm gonna be arrested and get a ride from the officer. And they said, well, yeah, that's, that's actually a fair assessment of what's going on. And so I'm freaking out, right? Like I'm absolutely freaking out at this moment is that I need to get across. One of the staff members graciously gets on the phone <clears throat> and starts begging a cab to come and show up. And so this cab driver apparently says, okay, and I've, I've assured him, I am going to pay the full price. You will be reimbursed. And I go and I sit on the curb in front of the gate and I'm just waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And this guy doesn't seem to be coming any moment soon. And I can't go back to call again and make sure because then maybe I miss him and he goes off and he's never coming back after that. And as I'm sitting there, I'm kind of freaking out. I begin to think about exactly this story, about how Paul and Silas are in a prison, that they've been assaulted, that they've been stripped naked, that they've been, they were just going to church and they are in prison and they choose to respond in the middle of the night by singing songs of praise. And I said, listen, this is a serious situation, God, <clears throat> but if they can praise in that scenario, I can sit and praise while I'm waiting for a cab. And so, 
I was that guy. I'm sitting on the curb and I'm singing worship songs. And for those of you who know me well, you know how awkward that is for everybody walking by because you know how it sounds when I sing out loud. But I'm singing out loud. And eventually the cab shows up. And in that moment, I begin to realize and understand that God hadn't abandoned me, but God had actually ordained and designed a moment to meet an individual that he wanted me to speak with. You see, I got in the van and the cab, that, which was a van, and he was a person of color in Ohio, and he had been the subject of intense discrimination and racism for the majority of his life. And he just carried with him this weight and this brokenness. And as we were able to have a conversation about his story, I was able to apologize to him and begin to speak truth to him and say, listen, this is not who God says you are. And that, what has happened to you with people using the name of Jesus, that is wrong. That is evil. And it breaks the heart of God. But let me tell you today what God really thinks and believes about you. And by the time we were at the shop, he asked me if I would pray for him. It was absolutely incredible. Now, I'm not saying that, that just because I sang a song that the cab showed up. Not at all. It, it would have shown up either way. But what I am saying is that as we look at spiritual disciplines, the purpose is to position us to experience transformation. And I believe that because I chose the discipline of worship, I was positioned to experience that moment of transformation. And if instead of singing and worshiping, that I would have sat there and lamented and complained and just freaked out and panicked about how terrible this situation was, I'm not sure that I would have been in the right place to share truth with the person that needed to hear it. And so my friends, there are two times in your life when you should worship, when you feel like it and when you don't. So, how do we worship? Well, worship is something that we do, and we learn to worship by worshiping. But there are a few practices that you can put into place, some steps that you can take that I believe will enhance your worship experience. So, without any further ado, I want to introduce to you the classic Christian worship stances. Carry the TV. Big screen variation. My fish was this big. Hold my baby. Touchdown and heartburn variation. All kidding aside, for all of the discussion of worship in the Bible, there is no correct way to worship. There's a correct one to worship, obviously, Jesus. But there's not a correct way to worship. It's not like there's this checklist or form that we have to follow. I do think that there is an incorrect way to worship. I mean, if your arms are crossed like this and your face looks like this as the song is being played, you're probably not worshiping Jesus. I don't know if you know the song Happy Day. It's an older one. It goes, oh, happy day, happy day, when you wash my sin away. Well, I got to tell you, that song has been permanently ruined for me because I saw a worship team over and over again play this song and their faces looked like this. Oh, happy day, happy day. And I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking to myself, really, you're happy? Please tell your face. But again, guys, as it comes back to this idea of how do we worship? Well, the reality is, that any spiritual discipline is a precursor to worship. So prayer is a precursor to worship. Confession is a precursor to worship. When you take a moment and you have that conversation with your neighbor that Holy Spirit has been asking you to have, and you silently ask him, you say, is there anything you want to say through me right now, today? That is worship. So if you've been following along and practicing any of the spiritual disciplines that we have discussed over the last eight weeks, congratulations, you are worshiping God. But as it comes to this idea of worship, most people think of singing with this idea, just like Paul and Silas did, the singing spiritual songs and hymns. 
So many of us know what that looks like, but there are some best practices that we can employ that will enhance that worship experience. Number one, worship throughout the week. Paul in the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. So don't save the only moment of your worship for the moment where you're gathered together, whether that's physical or online. Number two, worship God when you are alone or in a small group. I used to tell our students all the time that we get super excited about youth convention and it seemed like there was passionate worship there and then we'd come back to a smaller group and everybody would be real awkward and reserved and you know, I just see two different individuals worshiping in two different ways. And often I'd have to remind myself and others that if we can't worship in a small group, we're not really worshiping God, we're worshiping the atmosphere. Something that you can do that's really practical, number three, is to prepare for the worship experience. So how about this? Go to bed early. Right? Like, if you go to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, the night before you're gathering together, don't be surprised when you walk away and you feel like God didn't speak to you. It's not because he wasn't speaking. It's because you didn't hear him since you were exhausted and probably unnecessarily so. And eliminate unnecessary distractions, okay? So turn the notifications off on your device. And if you've eliminated unnecessary distractions... Embrace the distractions that remain. I mean, maybe your kids are crawling on your lap and you can't do much about that other than ask God, are you trying to speak to me through this experience right now? Let go of your own agenda. Number five, let go of your own agenda and allow God to move in a way that you didn't expect. And finally, offer a sacrifice of worship. It's called a sacrifice because it doesn't depend on our feelings. Sometimes we don't want to do it, but we bring it anyway. Because there are two times in life when you should worship. When are they? When you feel like it and when you don't. You know, I'm really feeling like there's one more thing that we need to say about this discipline of worship. And it's the result of worship. Worship begins with holy expectancy and it results in holy obedience. If worship doesn't result in greater obedience, it wasn't really worship. You know, we live in a time where many people who say that they're Christians really treat Jesus more like he's their on-again, off-again boyfriend than their Lord and Savior. You know, it's easy for us to say to somebody that we don't have a great commitment to, I'll, I'll get around to that. I'll, uh, sure, I'm, when I'm in the mood. But my friends, if someone really is our Lord, we don't say no. The answer is, yes, Lord. And so I just had the thought that, that maybe if there's some distance between you and Jesus this morning, maybe you need to ask yourself the question, what's the last thing that he asked me to do? And then ask yourself the question, did I do it? Because that right there, that crucial answer of obedience might have a lot to do with your position and where you find yourself today. Remember that the purpose of every spiritual discipline is to experience, to, to be positioned to experience the transformation that God wants you to experience. And that positioning, that transformation depends upon our obedience. There's a man named Willard Sperry who says that worship is a deliberate and disciplined adventure in reality. Worship isn't about nice songs. It's not about being comfortable or, or about being entertained. It's about an adventurous life in the spirit, about replacing rites and rituals with genuine communion with our heavenly father and giving him the honor that he deserves and expecting to hear his voice and saying yes to him. It's about what Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, as you sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So I want to invite you to take a next step. And in just a moment, I'm going to tell you what that looks like. A little bit more than 20 years ago, there was a worship leader named Matt Redman who was serving at a church just outside of London, England. And this church, it was thriving. 
I mean, people were showing up and there was excitement and, and there were young people and there was growth, but the pastor just discerned that something was a little bit off, that maybe people were showing up for the show and not for Jesus. And so he did something radical. He stripped away all of the music all of the microphones and the lights and the instruments. And he said, instead of the four to six song set list every week, we are simply going to sit and center our thoughts on Jesus. Well, as you can imagine, that was probably pretty awkward for the first number of weeks. But out of that season, there was this beautiful movement that was birthed with genuine communion and worship with their heavenly father. Well, that worship leader Matt Redman he he wrote a song <clears throat> coming out of that experience and it's called the heart of worship and i want to share it with you today it says when the music fades and all is stripped away and i simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart i'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required i'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Now, I don't believe that God is asking us to no longer use instruments in our worship. That's certainly not what I'm saying. But this song really does demonstrate worship as a spiritual discipline. That that the heart of worship, it's, it's not about us having our favorite playlist or our preferred volume or our style or comfort level. It's all about Jesus. And so let's take a next step right now. And if you're at home, I want to invite you to sing along with us as we use this song, The Heart of Worship. Wherever you are, center your mind and your heart on the object of our worship, Jesus. Because he alone is worthy. And think about what it is that he has done for us and also his character. And expect him to speak to you and to meet with you today. No matter how you're feeling. Listen, there are two times in your life when you should worship. When you feel like it and when you don't. Because it's not about you. And he wants to meet with you today. So let's do it right now.